So when it comes to preparation, especially about Christmas and thinking about Christmas, it's a highly philosophic technical term. It's a weird duck. In fact, when we look at the history of Christmas and December 25th season, it really wasn't part of the Christmas, tra- it wasn't part of the written tradition of the church until around 336. And even then, it wasn't mentioned until 356. So they were citing a piece in 356 about something that happened in 336, and that was really the first official mention of Christmas being tied to December 25th. In fact, what that means is it was over three centuries after Jesus walked the earth that we tried to pinpoint December 25th as being tied to the Nativity. Now, that's not to say that the Nativity wasn't celebrated. The Nativity was celebrated. In fact, we know that as early as the second century, there was discussion about the Nativity, Jesus' birth, and expectation and celebration. In fact, as early as the second century, the Archbishop, or excuse me, the Bishop of Rome, Telephorus, wrote about singing what he called the Angel's Hymn, and we have no idea what the Angel's Hymn sounded like, to commemorate the Nativity, though we have no idea what the date was. According to Clement of Alexandria, who wrote in the second and third centuries, the birth date was up in the air and ranged from April 20th or 21st to May 20th. Even now, when we look at how people try to pinpoint the day of Christmas being the date of Jesus' birth, I've seen responses that range from the date and predicting the birth of Jesus due to lamb reproduction, to numerology, to Roman census practices, to a bunch of other weird considerations. In other words, we don't know. So why all the variation? We don't know. The truth is the early church acknowledged the birth of Jesus, but they didn't celebrate in a way that we did or in a way that they did the crucifixion and the resurrection. It's cultural to celebrate birthdays. And this was a culture that just didn't. So how do we get to December 25th? Well, the answer there is even more complicated. In general, there are two prevailing theories. The first is that Christmas represents a sort of Christianization of pagan holidays and practices around the solstice. The Roman Empire, for instance, had two notable celebrations during this time. Saturnaria, which was in mid-December in a celebration of Saturn, and Sol Invictus, the feast celebrating Sol, which was a god of the sun, that was celebrated around December 25th. The idea behind this approach assumes that Christianity saw these celebrations and began to adapt some of its practices to integrate people into the religious tradition. The idea is that as Christianity spread, it would ease people into believing by adapting holidays that were already practiced. And we see this in some of the symbols that we use. So the Christmas tree. The Christmas tree became a symbol around the eighth century when Boniface was trying to minister to Germans. And if you don't know the story, it's a hoot. He was trying to minister to people. He saw this big, huge, giant tree called the Tree of Thor that they were worshiping, and he did what any good missionary did, took an axe or a fire, depending on your tradition, and burned it and destroyed it. And he said, if your God was real, he's going to smite me down, and that didn't happen. And then he pointed out a small evergreen and said, this is what the Christ is, eternal, always present, there. And so the Christmas tree became a symbol as a response to a pagan practice. As I'm sure you're also aware, several of the traditions that we do during Christmas are tied to specifically non-Christian festivals and practices. The Yule log, kissing under the mistletoe, giving gifts and feasts are all festivals to, are all tied to festivals of Saturn, the solstice, or other local holidays. That's one possibility. The other possibility as to why we celebrate December 25th is based on a medieval practice and understanding of the lives of great men. Because ancient and medieval thinkers thought that the day of conception, sorry, we're getting a little PG-13 here, so I apologize in advance. The day of conception coincided with the day of death. So what they did, they didn't realize that it's over nine months, and so they would figure out when you died, that was the day that you were conceived, and then they just counted nine months, and that was the day that you were born. To put it more precisely, it was thought that the day the great men were conceived and the day that they died were on the same day or same season. Death wasn't concrete. Early on in the church, they weren't sure which was the day of Jesus' death, so the birth wasn't either. That's why when we look at the entirety of the Christian tradition, while the majority of the Christian tradition celebrates on December 25th, there are portions of the Christian tradition that celebrate on January 6th, which we call Epiphany. 
By the way, there's also similar assumptions about this idea in the Jewish tradition as well. In the Jewish Talmud, it discusses how periods of historical redemption throughout Jewish history were all in the same month or time of year. So it's not unreasonable to think that early Christian Jews may have held a similar belief. So, does that mean that Christmas isn't Christian? Well, no. As mentioned before, the nativity was observed relatively early in the Christian tradition. And while not as important as the death and resurrection, the birth date was acknowledged. They recognized that although famous Christian thinker Origen said at one point that uh, wise men of God cursed the day that they were born. <laughs> Let's be honest, though. For early on in the church history, birth dates weren't particularly important. And if you think that they were important to the tradition, I ask you how many exact birth dates are mentioned in Scripture? Not many. With all this uncertainty about the holiday, Christians have struggled historically with how to approach it. Tertullian, a second and third century writer, speaks about Christians trying to follow non-Christian customs. He says, if men have consecrated themselves for this custom, non-Christian custom, from superstition, do you, estranged as you are from all their vanity, participate in solemnities consecrated to idols? As if for you, you were also some sort of prescript about a day. In other words, he was saying, why do you celebrate non-Christian participations. William Bradford, who was the governor of Plymouth Colony, punished people who celebrated Christmas. In fact, Christmas was banned in Boston in 1659 because it was seen as too extravagant. In all these cases, it was thought that Christmas was full of too much eating, drinking, consuming, feasting. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? So the question of how the church has historically prepared for Christmas is a hard one. So let me close by proposing something to you. Historically, this season is a season of purple. And what purple means in the Christian tradition is penance. In fact, if you look over at our Advent calendar, purple candles, there's a reason there. It's a season of penance. And that's one of the reasons why we think about this season. It, purple is the color of present penance and mourning. Now, for us Protestants, the word penance carries a ton of baggage. For on the surface, as Protestants who hold to the idea that Christ alone serves as high priest to us, the idea that penance as confession might feel like nails on a chalkboard. After all, Hebrews 4 and 5 makes it clear that we go to the creator and sustainer of all reality through the Son alone. But if we think of a season of penance not as a time of confession, but as a time of reconciliation, there might be an idea there. In fact, if you look at some of the contemporary penance practices, it is about reconciliation. Acts of penance include things like praying, fasting, almsgiving. All of those things are found in the church tradition. And while I expect that Jason and Gary might talk about those things in detail, I at least want to put the idea of reconciliation with God on the table. And I wouldn't be myself if I didn't include at least a little bit of Augustine. So let me conclude with a discussion about almsgiving because we think it's just about giving money. No. Here's what Augustine says. On the principle of interpretation, our Lord saying, give alms of such things as you have, and behold, all these things are clean to you, applies to every useful act that a person does in mercy. Not then the man who gives food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, clothing to the naked, hospitality to the stranger, the shelter to the fugitive, who visits the sick and the imprisoned, ransoms the captive, assists the weak, leads the blind, comforts the sorrowful, heals the sick, puts the wanderer on the right path, gives advice to the perplexed, supplies the wants of the needy. Not this man only, but the man who pardons the sinner gives alms. This is a season of reconciliation, of pouring ourselves out. It is a time in our calendar year that is weird, it's uncertain, it's dark. This is a season of loss. 
And I think that's all okay. Because what we're left with is a question to ask during the season, and that is, why do I do what I do? So perhaps the history of the church and the preparation for the nativity is to begin to see ourselves clearly, to know who we are and to know whose we are. Amen. As I mentioned, we'll take different aspects of the preparation, and so I want to transition us from more of a historical, uh, traditional approach to a corporate one. So all of us together as a group, what does preparation look like for us collectively as a whole church family, whole family of Jesus followers? I want to take us into a little bit of what it looked like in Israel as they were preparing for Jesus and how God arranged that John the Baptist would be born six months previous to Jesus and be a forerunner of Christ and also direct people's attention to him. And so I want to take a few moments to talk about that. And one of the things that I appreciate about John uh, is we have personal conversations as well. And when we were talking about this uh, topic of preparation and penance and confession, One of the words that he gave me in our conversation was reorientation. And I remember that there was a time when I was a freshman in college, after my freshman year of college, between that and my sophomore year, I worked a job at a camp as a camp counselor, but it was on a 500-acre horse ranch in Maryland, out east. And I had never been a part of ranch life ever before, and I'd never been a counselor at a youth camp before. And so it wasn't just a week of orientation that I had to go through as a counselor. It was a week of reorientation because I had to think about a lot of things very differently. I had to think instead of uh, going out to grab dinner at a local fast food restaurant with a few of my friends, I had to think about these group collective meals, home style meals, family style meals served around the table because the nearest town was about 30 miles away and I only got to go there one day a week to wash my laundry. So I didn't have access to any of those things. I had to learn how to ride because we were taking campers on trail rides every single week, and so they taught us some of that. I had to learn how to bale hay for the first time because they put us to work on the ranch, uh, not only with the kids, and we were involved in rodeos and things of that nature as well, which was totally foreign to me. I had to learn how to operate in this totally new environment and how to think like a camp counselor and how to think like a rancher, quite honestly, for about three months of my summer. And so I had to completely shift my perspective. And I feel like that's why God sent John the Baptist as the forerunner of Christ. Because Israel, if they were going to be prepared for Jesus' arrival, they really had to shift their complete perspective. Not just on an individual basis, which Gary will come and share about in a moment, but on a collective basis. And so John was calling people out from the region of Judea, all throughout Israel, out into the desert, uh, to share a message with them. A message of turning their hearts back toward God. I want to share a few verses from Matthew chapter 3. It says, Now in those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the word repent, again, John mentioned words that carry baggage, and that word can certainly have a lot of different meanings depending on what you've heard and how you've heard it used. But repentance in the New Testament means to change your mind. Reorient yourself is what John the Baptist was preaching. And then scripture says, For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one calling out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. A lot of you probably have heard that comparison uh, to this uh, prophecy that was given to Isaiah and how it was a prediction about John the Baptist. But have you ever looked at Isaiah chapter 40 where that comes from to get a little more context? I've always wondered what was John saying in the wilderness? Because the Gospels don't really tell us much. He was the one called to prepare the way for Jesus, but we don't know what he said, or do we? Because in Isaiah 40, it says, a voice says, call out. It says, then he, this prediction toward John the Baptist, answered, what shall I call out? So we actually do get a glimpse into the message that John was proclaiming. And here's the message. And it's not fluffy, and it's not warm, like this season can be. It says, Then he answered, this is God's answer to what you should cry out. All flesh, all of us, all living, breathing people, it's like grass. And all of its loveliness, and that term in the Old Testament means kindness. So think about, I mean, all of us want to be kind, right? That's that's kind of a thing I think that our culture longs for, is to treat other people with kindness and compassion. I would say the majority of people, kindness is a big thing even these days. But it says all of its loveliness, all of its kindness is like the flower of the field. 
We think, well, that's great. Grass can be nice, and, you know, we like to walk on it beneath our feet, and flowers, they're beautiful. But then it says, the grass withers and the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. So it's this reminder that we are like grass and like flowers because this time of the year, the grass goes dormant and the flowers die. And it's like a vapor and it's very short. So God is reorienting us and God reoriented Israel through the voice of John the Baptist into realizing that as great as we feel and as significant as we feel and as accomplished as we feel in life, we really are small, especially in comparison with God. And as we prepare for Jesus' arrival in our minds and his second coming at some point in the future, we really need to realize who we are, and that is someone small, in comparison especially with who the Lord is. That chapter goes on, and it lists a few things about God, and it lists a few things about us in Isaiah 40. And this is what God continues in that chapter to say about us. It says, behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket. So remember that word drop, right? One drop from a bucket. All are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. So think about a speck of dust. And this is all the nations, not us, but nations of people. It says, he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Again, this is us. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He who reduces rulers to nothing. He who makes the judges of the earth, the people who are in positions of power and making decisions, meaningless. And then God says, to whom then will you compare me, that I would be as equal, says the Holy One. And so, being grass and being flowers, the other descriptive words that describe us are drops and dust and grasshoppers and nothing and meaningless. We can't take that too far because we know that Christ loves us and paid a great price for us. But on the preparation side of things, we have to reorient ourselves and realize that we are small and God is great. It goes on to say in Isaiah 40, again, this is the chapter that predicts John the Baptist coming in his message. It says, to whom then will you liken God or what likeness will you compare with him? I want you to close your eyes for a moment and listen about the descriptions given then of God. So we are dust, we are drops, we are grasshoppers, but here is who God is. The one who's measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. He measured heavens with a span. He calculated the dust of the earth with a measure. And he weighed all the mountains in balance and the hills in a pair of scales. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or whose counselors informed God? With whom did he consult? Who gave God understanding and taught him justice and knowledge and understanding? It says, raise your eyes on high. And see who's created the stars, the one who calls them all by name. Not one of them is missing because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. So we are small and God is great. And preparing is reorienting ourselves to see ourselves as we truly are and catching a glimpse of God as he truly is. It's also two other quick things reorienting, secondly, preparation as a congregation of us. It's all of us seeing our smallness and God's greatness, but it's also all of us opening ourselves up to this concept of simplification because holidays here in the United States are anything but simple. Our lives get so complicated and complex and our calendars get so full and our bank accounts get so empty, at least mine has, trying to shop for Christmas gifts and maybe even going a little bit too much on some of those Christmas gifts. And I've seen that spread throughout our family and extended family. You want to be invested and involved, but sometimes preparation is simplifying. This is what Matthew chapter 3, where it introduces John the Baptist ministry, goes on to say. It says, John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and his food with locusts and wild honey. Talk about a simple person. Camel hair wasn't particularly enviable in Jewish culture. White was kind of the garment. White, clean linen was preferable. And so he's wearing itchy, scratchy camel hair. Camels weren't even clean animals. Jewish wouldn't eat them because they were considered unclean. And so here's this guy that's kind of unclean and scraggly wandering around in the wilderness. And he doesn't bother himself with the meals and the wine and everything that would be available in Jerusalem just several miles away. Instead, he's eating locusts and wild honey, whatever he can find. And so perhaps as we prepare for Christ's arrival, 
collectively, we can find ways to simplify. And even as a church family, you'll see things kind of shutting down around the holiday season. Because we want to reduce and we want to simplify and give you time to focus on things that are the most important instead of having activity after activity after activity to monopolize your time here with us. That's important, but so is being simple. Finally, I want to wrap up with this. It says, At the time Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea and the region around the Jordan, so they were all going out, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. So there was this process of confession or penance or repentance that was happening. And the term for confession, um, it's ex homo legato. Ex means out. They were They were verbalizing these things. They were getting them out. But homo means same, legato means words. And so what they were doing is they were agreeing with God. And again, they were reorienting and saying, God, your priorities are important. Your truths are important. So help me to reorient myself with what's important and what's true from your perspective. And in that, I'll find preparation. And so I want to challenge us collectively as a church family to reorient ourselves, to have this common confession of coming back to the table of what does God say about what the priorities and the importance are in life, and how can I simplify instead of complicate this Christmas season, not just individually, but collectively. I'll welcome Gary up now to conclude us today. I think it might be safe to say that you can kind of tell how important something is to somebody by how much they prepare for it. I think that that can be a pretty good indicator, not 100% across the board, but how important is the Christmas season uh, to the person who decorates the outside of their house for a month before December even gets here? I think it's pretty safe to say it's it's pretty important to them. Uh, How important is football to the person who puts the work in to clear their schedule for every game their team plays that season? I'd say the preparation would say it's pretty important to them. How important is camping to a person who tests all of their gear before they embark on the journey? Uh, you can tell a lot uh, about how someone prepares. And in, in some ways, I think it can be clearer evidence of how important something is to somebody than actually making time for the thing. And it might sound a little weird at first, but think about it like this. Two people can show up for a party. One, because they felt guilted into it. And the other, because they've been uh, working for weeks on crafting their Christmas sweater for the Christmas sweater contest that they're hoping they're going to win. Two people can show up to some kind of religious function. One, because they're afraid God's going to be mad at them if they don't. Maybe they think he works that way. Or the other, because they've closely been following what's being discussed or taught, and they're following that up with personal study during the week. Uh, Our preparation can say a whole lot, and uh, is it possible how we prepare for something is a better indicator of how important something is to us? If this is the case, how might this call us to reflect on what's truly important to us? Not what we think is important to us, but what that shows is truly important to us. Is there a thing or several things you or I know should be important to us, but part of our failure to give those things the importance they deserve is a lack of preparation. Now, this is a Christmas series, and unfortunately, I really haven't found any direct God-given suggestions to prepare for the Christmas season or Christmas Day, at least from a certain uh, perspective, But I do think that celebrating the arrival of Christ can be best accomplished by celebrating what he was coming to do. And I believe one of the best ways to do so is to prepare ourselves for the work he's wanting to do in our personal lives, if that's what we truly want. And for the sake of not sounding too creepily religious for those who haven't experienced personally investigating Jesus' true intentions, um, I'm, you know, because this is one of those things that can have a lot of baggage with it. I'm referring to him offering us the option to seek to walk a path that is for the good of all. So very succinctly here this morning, 
I just want to mention three themes uh, to keep in mind when it comes to giving importance to something by personally putting together a way to prepare. So, if it's important, we should probably prepare for it. And here are three things to keep in mind when doing that. Right? First of all, preparation is partly principle. Right? Preparation, um, and I'm, these are, this is not giving every aspect of preparation, but I'm going to just talk about three. First of all, preparation is partly principle. Uh, just to give an example, this 2 Timothy 2.21 says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, referencing some things previously mentioned, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. So we see here an example of how scripture is a reference for us when it comes to preparation. Do you want to be well prepared for these types of things? Scripture does have some things to offer in that area, mostly to be used in personal reflection The Bible does hold many principles that help prepare us for what God wants to do in us and through us. So in other words, those things we referenced that we know should be important in our lives, we know they should be, God's truths can teach us how to be the kind of person who acts in such a way that allows those things to become important and have the effect on us and those around us they're intended to. I'm going to repeat that again because there's kind of a lot in there. But God's truths can teach us how to be the kind of person who acts in such a way that allows those things that should be important to be important and have the effect on us and those around us they're intended to. So some of this process requires learning how not every aspect that we attach to important themes is actually good for everyone. But I believe God's truths at their heart hold wonderful principles for preparation. There's so many options for learning from God's truths nowadays, and that's great. Uh, But for those seeking to emphasize important themes in their lives, I would encourage everyone um, to, when you're pursuing those options, to keep in mind, what am I learning about how to prepare for this? So whatever that is that you feel God is placing on your heart that should be of importance as you learn from God's word in whatever avenue you do, keep in mind, what am I learning about how to prepare the way for this thing in my life, for its arrival in my life? And then, you know, through that into our community here. Uh, So one theme to keep in mind when we are preparing the way for these things is principles, the principles in God's word. Uh, Another thing, preparation is partly cultural. Preparation actually is partly cultural. Um, If you want to spend a very, I I could have spent a whole afternoon on this. I didn't have time for it, but I would have loved to. I was looking up uh, different cultural differences. um, And I was specifically looking for ones that we feel very strongly about here in America, where it's so proper here, but uh, you look at another culture and it's the exact opposite. Exact opposite response. So here's a few examples of that. Um, tipping people for things, service of, of several different kinds here uh, in America is very accepted. And in fact, if you don't in certain situations, it's an insult. You're basically saying, you did a terrible job. I'm not tipping you. Well, there are other cultures where if you do tip someone, they'll be insulted by the fact that you're trying to do some shady deal on the side by handing them money what are you doing? They take pride in their job. That's a complete insult. Very, very interesting. Another area would be the time that you arrive at certain things. Now, that, there's a little bit more of a spectrum here, I think, in America. Uh, but there are countries where if you are not 5 to 15 minutes early, it's an insult uh, to some there that you'd be arriving for. Other countries, if you get there on time, it's about the same as being an hour early and some cultures, and it's an insult, why would you inconvenience people by actually showing up at the time we said? Everybody knows it's an hour past then. That's when it, you know, and it's not, neither one really, neither one's wrong. It feels wrong to some cultures, but last one I want to share, uh, one of the things uh, culturally here in our culture, if you go somewhere and you eat food um, and you don't finish your plate, uh, it might communicate either you didn't like it 
or you don't care about people who are starving in the world. Um, there are other cultures where if you actually finish all the food on your plate, you've insulted them because you've communicated that they didn't actually prepare enough food for you. Just kind of wild the differences, and again, none of them are wrong, but it, it shines a little bit of light on how fickle our cultural preferences can be. Uh, but the Apostle Paul was constantly dealing with people using uh, their cultural preferences to judge others, and he consistently worked towards unity regardless of differences, but, but he never taught that the cultural practices should be discarded. Unless, of course, an individual felt it was leading them to do wrong. His point wasn't, let's get rid of these, they're in the way. There is a good argument for the fact that there's an aspect of good attached to pretty much everything. Um, and we take that good and we turn it into bad. But many cultural preferences can be utilized, at least personally, to make things more meaningful. And I think they should be. How much less honorable and personally unhelpful would it be if we just left peop people when they passed away, and I'm not trying to be crass here, but right where uh, they passed away, or we just took them and put them in a pile somewhere. Again, I'm not trying to be crass. There is a lot of meaning and helpfulness to the cultural uh, preferences and, and things that we've come up with, even though one of those things we might do, uh, preparing somebody for burial, may, me may be completely meaningless to somebody in another culture. So how could, I think a good question to ask in light of this is, how could talking to others or researching our own culture's practices help us or you, or me, put together a kind of preparation that helps us emphasize those important themes uh, we spoke of earlier, those things we know should be important. Hopefully you're picking up on a theme here um, when it comes to what uh, the role preparation should play and what that looks like. But the last uh, aspect I want to look at is that preparation is partly personal. Right? Another theme to keep in mind when it comes to preparing for something, it's partly personal. Uh, I, I try to think of something from my life that kind of stood out, and, and for, for whatever reason, the first thing that popped in my head was, was my dad pacing, okay, pacing back and forth. I don't do it as much up here because I'm tied to my notes, but what I had displayed for me my entire life, whenever there was something uh, mentally grueling or something like that that really needed to be focused on and pay attention to, my dad would pace back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And uh, he might be talking, he might be thinking, he might be praying, he might be meditating. I, I saw my, my grandfather do it as well. Um, but that, that stood for that. And, and, and so I, without even realizing it, something that has happened in my life is it's taken on a symbolism and an association with serious contemplation for me. And so personally for me, I'm not taking something generally as seriously as I could if I'm sitting in a room surrounded by a bunch of people having conversations. For me, what you, you'll see me, if you saw me at home uh, or whatever, I'd be, I'd be off pacing, and, and that, that would be my thing. And you would know he's really working through something right now because that's what that symbolizes to me, and that's what I need to do. I've identified that's something I need to do to be able to um, mentally really focus on things. Another example from my life would be through trial and error and God's faithfulness, I've learned that the best thing for me that I can do to allow God to speak into the painful situations I'm going through is to get away from everything and everyone outside, go on a walk, and have a casual conversation uh, with God about those things. And that's very, very personally helpful uh, to me. Uh, again, my wife's actually very different than that. And I there was a time in my life I kept encouraging her over and over and over, oh, do it, do this, this will really, really help. And eventually we realized that things are, we, we were raised different ways and had different experiences. Um, but there's, there's value to finding out what personally, it, for me, could help make preparation meaningful and help make that important thing meaningful. I think a good question for us to ask in light of this is this. So let's think about this for a second. Are we sure we're not just constantly asking what should be important to us instead of a possible better question that asks, how do we give something importance? See the difference there. Are we wasting our time simply asking what should be important when we already know, and the better question is, how do we give that thing importance? A good example of this would be, or one example, uh, we shouldn't assume that just because our local 
physical church leadership puts together a service that learning about and living out what God wants to accomplish will automatically become important to us. Um, considering principle and cultural and personal aspects of preparation, I think may be a journey we each need to go on to go go through as we think of each thing that's important to us. If something's important to us, if we really want that important thing to impact us and those around us, I think it's it's valuable to consider whether maybe we need to look at our preparation that's attached to that thing. Uh, again, I've been blessed by the other things I heard from um, up here this morning. And it just kind of trying to wrap everything up that we've talked about here this morning. Preparation is historical and should be, and we should look at that. Sometimes it's, it's corporate or all of us together, and we should consider that. And sometimes it's personal. Um, but... If preparation prepares the way for something, what will we make sure has a way prepared for it in our lives and our community? What should we be preparing the way for personally or as far as our household is concerned? What should we be preparing the way for in this community right here in this room, this family, or in this greater community surrounding us? Jason and I and others have been excitedly preparing for this new year in relation to this community here and our greater community. Um, to pre- in one way, one way I could define this is by preparing the way for hope. We talked a little bit about this last week, um, but as we talk about preparation and preparing for the arrival of Christ, there's certainly hope attached to that. Not hope of joining our team, or simply being on this team, but the hope we believe Jesus stands for with no strings attached. Anything from preparing for the hope that is the genius of Jesus affecting our lives to helping someone just get through another week in our community because that's where some people are at, maybe even some of us here in our congregation. I want to close with just a couple illustrations these came to me actually just this last week. Um, uh, whether you call that divine or not, I don't know. But uh, they were significant to me. I enjoy watching um, Christmas movies at Christmas time. Who doesn't? Maybe there are a few that don't. I really enjoy watching uh, older Christmas movies, uh, black and white ones during uh, Christmas time. My, uh, my favorite Christmas movie is, is It's a Wonderful Life. Um, but uh, has anyone here ever seen the movie The Bishop's Wife with Cary Grant? Anybody seen that? A few people? Okay. It's a, it's a good, it's a little bit of a comedy. Um, it's got some actually pretty good uh, things to ponder in there. But to just give you the rundown real quick, uh, there's a bishop in the movie of a church, and he's worried because he wants to build this huge cathedral um, because he wants to build something that everybody can look up and look at that will give hope to the city. And Cary Grant plays an angel. And he comes and he visits the bishop and he kind of helps him navigate several things in his life. But they're having a discussion about this cathedral that I thought was very interesting. It's kind of a theme that I think has been an issue throughout the centuries. But he's talking to the angel about this. He's casting the vision, the hope it's going to cast for the whole city. And the angel just uh, says to him, you know, that, that, that sounds like that could cast some hope. I agree. But he says, but what do you think about a whole bunch more smaller roofs over people who don't have them. How much more hope do you think that would bring? And I just kind of sat there. I actually paused the movie for a moment. I just thought, that's an interesting thought. Another thing, uh, the other thing, other illustration I want to close with is I was watching on YouTube, somebody posted a video. It sounds a little creepy at first, and I thought it sounded a little creepy at first, but a guy took a sign and he set it out in front of him, and it said, free hugs. And he put, uh, it wasn't scary or anything, but he put a mask or something over his face. Um, and I wondered why he did that at first, uh, but I thought it was actually kind of genius. It sounds creepy, but it was, it was basically to kind of, because there's a difference between, you know, like, for instance, going up and hugging Santa, somebody dressed as Santa, and somebody dressed, you know, just a regular guy on the street saying, hey, come here, free hugs, okay? No, thanks, all right? But what was interesting, 
I, I, went, I went from that's creepy to kind of being, in a, sense, in, in a sense, deeply convicted because I then began to watch as people would stop and they would be, they'd start hugging him and they wouldn't stop. They would just stand there and then, and he was mic'd and they would start, and they filmed it from behind so you couldn't see what it was, but people would hug him and they would start and he would say, how are you doing? They'd say, not great. I'd say, what, what are you dealing with? And they would just pour out these things that they're going through. Um, and it was, it was heartbreaking and it really, really impacted me. And as I'm looking forward to the new year and, and as I'm thinking about what I'm preparing the way for, as I'm thinking about what we as a family are preparing the way for in this community, in the greater community, um, what, what kind of stuff are we preparing the way for? And when I specifically thought about hope, I thought, does Jesus stand for hope? Yes, yes, he does. But it's that other stuff that it looks like. It's not being on Team Hope. It's not just reiterating over and over and over the icon that Jesus is hope. Are we preparing the way for what hope actually looks like? I appreciate what John said about the almsgiving. And we all, our, our mind automatically goes to one specific place. But really, it means so much more. It means preparing the way for so much more. And so I, I mean this, I'm not actually, I'm not looking for any type of verbal response in this moment or anything along those lines, but I kind of want to sort of end everything just with this sort of an invitation to all of us as a community. As we're moving through this Christmas series, as we're, as we're preparing for, uh, you know, uh, in, in a sense, the arrival or at least a reminder of, the, reminder of the arrival of Christ, will we all join together in preparing the way for that kind of hope in our personal lives, in this community and here, and in this greater com- community? Will we join in together in really looking at what does it look like for us to prepare for that? Because I believe it's going to take looking at all those things. But will we, jo- will we all join in doing that? I'm going to go ahead and close in prayer. Um, and then I don't think we have a song or anything following up. But, uh, uh, and then we'll be, we'll be dismissed. But I, I hope that we can, we can take some time to ponder preparation. Starting, start, maybe starting on a personal level. Maybe that's a good way to start. And, and hopefully working outwards together as a, as a body. Dear Lord, I just thank you. Um, I, I don't know how this hit everybody this morning, having a little bit something different like this. Um, several different perspectives, several different thoughts, focusing on several different areas. But Lord, I, I knew what I was bringing, was hoping to bring to the table uh, this morning, Lord, but I was blown away by how much I was blessed by the whole process. Um, just this well-rounded, diverse look at preparation. Um, God, I personally feel like if, we're, if we exist and we're not bringing some kind of tangible, life-changing, altering hope, um, even if it's just one person, I mean, that's, that's worth it, but that kind of hope um, to our community and to each other simultaneously um, I, think, I think we seriously need to look at how we prepare and what we're preparing for, Lord. Um, I don't think anybody in here is opposed to these thoughts or these ideas. I know I'm not, but I know that if I don't do a good job of preparing for things, um, they rarely show up the way in which I intend them to. Um, and Lord, so maybe you are asking us to all prepare in some way this morning. Um, We can't make blanket statements about that, Lord, but I just pray whatever you're doing in our hearts right now, whatever that thing is, um, could be completely different for everybody, Lord. I pray that we won't look away. I pray that we won't forget about it. I pray that we'll take the time to prepare. Guide us in doing that, Lord. Bring us together in doing that. And I just pray all these things, Lord, in your name.